I am joined now by Pamela Slim, who just had a fantastic presentation on the main stage. Let's welcome her and uh, say thank you once again. So awesome presentation on the main stage, a lot of nuts and bolts, how to. Uh, backstage, I think we're going to keep it a little more, the, that's the how, this is going to be a little bit more of the, of the why. Uh, for entrepreneurship, and I really love your personal story because uh, you made the leap from safe corporate cubicle nation into the uncertain world of entrepreneurship at a time when it wasn't necessarily vogue to do so. Tell us about the mid '90s when you made the leap from from Barclays. Maybe tell us a little bit what you're doing there, and it's a huge deal um, into the uncertain world of, of entrepreneurship. Yeah. So I was uh, living here in San Francisco, and I was working for Barclays Global Investors. I actually love my cubicle. I know it's scandalous for being the Escape from Cubicle Nation lady, but I, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with corporate life. Uh, I was a director of training for this a financial services investment firm, and so I got to learn about all kinds of things that were totally new to me. I would hang out with the traders early in the morning. Uh, I learned all about you know, organizational change and development. We scaled the organization. So it was actually a really interesting time and I really loved my job. Uh, on the side of my job, it was before I even knew to call it a side hustle, my side hustle was actually as a martial artist. Um, I was the executive director of a, a nonprofit martial arts organization for Capoeira, which is the Afro-Brazilian martial art. And so I would be in a dark blue suit with pearls and earrings during the day and nylons and heels and then I would run off to the mission and I would change into my Capoeira outfit and I would teach classes or take classes for a couple hours. We started a youth program here starting with one kid, Jimmy Harkin from Nicaragua, and we ended up growing that program to serve about 250 youth within the Bay Area. So I was doing all of these things, grant writing and uh, you know, teaching classes and trying to expand our program. But to me, it was always just, it's just what I did. It was a volunteer thing that had a huge just passion for me. Sure. So what happened is I turned 30 and I got pneumonia, I think from working like 100 hours a week for about 10 years straight. Right. <laughs> and um, I just, we, we went through an acquisition. It was actually when Barclays, you know, came over to take over the company. And I just felt like, you know what, I just want to change. I have no idea what it is. And the interesting thing was, I never thought that I had what it took to be an entrepreneur really? because I was a liberal arts major. My major was community development in Latin America. Um, you, can, I didn't, you can major in that? You can, I, exactly, right? It's like you can actually major in that. In community and development in Latin America. In Latin America, right. I lived yeah. in Colombia. I worked on projects looking at education as a tool for social change. Mm -hmm. I was passionate about social justice and economic development. So it made perfect sense to work for an investment oh, we're, we're bank. We're going to come back and, it? Yeah. Yeah, and, and talk about that. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's, it's um, yeah. So, you know, I think it was just, um, it was something I, I just was really ready to make a change. And I just quit with no plan, no idea about what I was going to do. I thought I was going to go look for other jobs because it just didn't even cross my mind to work for myself. So I started looking for other jobs. Nothing sounded interesting. A couple months went by. And finally, I called my old manager who I'd worked with at Barclays who had moved on to Hewlett Packard. And I said, you know, I kind of short a little bit of cash. Do you have anything going on? Maybe I could just do a little project for you. So I started to work with her, and it was in creating the worldwide um, management development curriculum at, at HP. And I had this moment, I kid you not, I remember it so clearly. I had to get my business license. And I had done an assignment when I did a class at UC Berkeley on um, a train, setting up a training business. It was based on the Dr. Seuss book, If I Ran the Circus. Okay. That was about as sophisticated as my business education was at that point. So like, based on if you could do anything that you'd want to do, what would it be? And I said I would want to be living in a Victorian in San Francisco and sipping lemonade and you know, lattes and working with clients you know, all over the place. And I would call my company ganas. Ganas is a Spanish word that I learned in Latin America that means intense desire to do something, inner motivation, drive. It's that good burning passion feeling that you have. And I want to call my company ganas. And so I remember the day I had to get a business license because I was an independent contractor. And I was like, oh my God, like I could actually do this. And then what I realized was for 10 years being the volunteer executive director for an organization, raising funds, marketing the business, growing programs was actually entrepreneurial. You'd already, you'd already done it. And I know it sounds absurd, like it's so obvious, but I actually had never drawn the correlation between that work as a volunteer right. actually being entrepreneurial. Well, and that's 
you know, going back, this was the mid '90s when it entrepreneurship wasn't so in vogue. Yeah. Entrepreneurship wasn't a word that people used. You were a small business owner. You ran a mom and pop shop or a barber shop or or whatever. Um, and and so that really wasn't the 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 concept of a side hustle just didn't really exist. So tell us how tell us a little bit more about like how y other entrepreneurs can kind of use that side hustle. Just a little bit about yeah as a starting point to kind of test the waters and get some entrepreneurial experience before jumping out. Into yeah, before thing. going. It's really what I recommend for most people now. And I think for me, you know, spending all of that time running a business essentially on the side, even though I didn't get paid, was a way to be developing very specific skills. And it, it's, it, I kind of, I feel very strong and passionate about it these days because I think that the world of work is never going to be have the same kind of stability that we've seen in prior decades or prior generations. I don't that, think it's necessarily bad. It's like right. gone, done, see ya. Yeah, we, we can either mourn it or we can accept the fact that right. the world has changed. It's changed. And the contractual relationship or the implied contract you have with an employer is just different. And that's, right. you, you lose a little bit of stability, but you gain a lot of flexibility. You get to design your own life as opposed to have to lock into the corporate nine to five. Exactly. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with being in a corporate. It's just we're all self-employed. Yes. Always. There's even, no guarantee of employment, even if you work for even, somebody else. Yeah. Even if you work for a university, even if you, you know, whatever you're doing, they're just different work modes. So the more you think about it that way, you really want, when, when you have some kind of a side hustle, when you're always developing skills, you have a backup plan. You have an idea and you want to test it. And I, my basic philosophy toward my life is my definition of success personally is enjoying my life while I am living it. And it sounds just basic or like, well, of course you want to enjoy it. But I take it quite seriously. It drives most of the things that I do, decisions that I make about what I choose to do, whom I choose to work with, if I want to scale my business or not, how I want to be as a parent. Right. I, I, if I'm going to be present, if I agree to do something, I want to be here and I want to do it. I want to enjoy it. I want to talk to people. I want to really enjoy the experience. Being a martial artist, I call it the full contact, full color life, yeah. right? I don't want to be halfway here and be annoyed and like be checking my, my iPhone and ignoring everybody yeah. that's here in the room, you know, being all fancy. I mean, I, that, that's not who I am. Right. I'm going to enjoy it by, if we have a real kind of connection. So, you know, I think that's um, just part of the whole experience of when you're able to really be developing skills and making sure that you're highly employable and, you know, doing things on the side learning things, building connections outside of your networks, that that's the way that you can actually build a lot of opportunities. And what happens when you begin to build a side hustle is maybe today what you have is not perfect, but your job can, you can be your own venture capitalist. Your job can be the engine that ends up funding whatever idea that you have on the side. The killer thing is when you're sitting there complaining and bitching and moaning about how horrible everything is, being totally bitter, I don't recommend it. I mean, tell your best friend, tell your spouse, that's totally fine. Yeah. But if you're gonna be somewhere and somebody's paying you to be there, do your very best to be there. Uh, there's a, a tool I use with my coaching clients, I call it the loathing scale. So if you have a scale from one to 10, <clears throat> one is like everything's totally cool, you enjoy your job. 10 is you get physically ill when you even think about going into work. And believe me. It like, happens. It happens. It happened to me. People get very, very yeah. ill. Yeah. So when you start to get in the 7 to 10 range of the loathing scale, like you better make a decision pretty quick, yeah. right? You're going to get Cause sick. Because you, you're, you're physically damaging yourself. You're physically damaging. So you're going to do one of two things. You're going to get physically sick or you're going to do a Jerry Maguire. You're going to give a speech, you're going to grab the goldfish, mm -hmm. and you're going to walk out and ask who's going with me. And I do not recommend that as entertaining as it is for right. Tom Cruise. I do not recommend that you do that. Yeah. So you have, I think, along with Tim Ferriss, are, are kind of one of two of the primary authors in my mind who are talking about redefining what success is in the workplace and in, in life. And the four hour work week was originally about creating space to enjoy the things that you most care about in the world. And, and you have a very, very similar thing. Talk about how you've seen, with the changing contract of work change, how more people are embracing your definition of success and kind of maybe some of the stories that you've, you've seen, you know, people go through your program. Yeah, you know, and first of all, I think we, one of the things we all need to define for ourselves is our own. I mean, that, that's really what works for me, and, and that's what's important is that I've thought about it and I've talked about it with my husband. You know, as a family, we kind of have that definition. Everybody's definition of success is really different, which is part of what you want to be considering when you're, when you're setting up your, your life and your work structure. 
to me, and, and I know that Tim, for Tim, it's not, he's not necessarily, people know him as sometimes thinking that you just work a tiny bit and then you just go off and you're at the beach and you play all the yeah. time, which is really not what, what he's about. Tim is one of the hardest workers I've ever met. Exactly. He puts in an incredible amount of time. Exactly. So to me, really what, um, what ends up happening when you begin to focus on uh, things that you're interested in is you really get invested in the power of creation. And to me, creating is where everything Everything that's interesting happens. It's where we learn and grow. It's where you get energized. It's where when you have the, earlier in my presentation, I talked about the valley of death. When you have your idea about what you want to do and you're just panicked to cross through to do the first thing to get it started, right? Yeah. As soon as you begin to actually create something, that's where all the magic happens. Um, believe it or not, I was watching CNN and uh, Piers Morgan was interviewing LL Cool J right before the Grammys because mm -hmm. he hosted the Grammys. It was during the elections and we're all like yelling at each other online and you know being unpleasant as we tend to do recently for right. some reason and uh and so Pierce said you know ll like what how can we keep america great like how can we kind of bring america back to greatness when, and, I, when I think of people who i want to give advice on the future of the company ll cool j comes i knew it see to that's mind. why yeah. i knew that <laughs> exactly well you'd be surprised a smart guy and he said he said you know first of all america's always great you know as is the rest of the world but what we need is we need to be creating. For the kids that have way too much money in the Hamptons that are just running around causing havoc, right? They need to create something. They need to have something to create. For kids that are in the neighborhoods where they don't have anything to do, they need to create something. And I thought, in my experience, running a martial art organization, working with a lot of kids that came from rough situations, parents in jail, you know, members of gangs, really, really rough poverty abuse, what got them over that valley of death into a really positive direction, and I'm proud to say all of the kids we initially worked with graduated from high school, which was not at all the norm, right, for kids in their situation, yeah. was creating something, was being excited by the art of capoeira, seeing what their bodies could do, working with other people, you know, feeling the music and creating and doing something. So I think as human beings, that's actually what we want to be doing. I get really bored. I love the beach, but if I spent my whole life just sitting around doing nothing, it wouldn't be exciting. That's right. where we develop mastery. That's where we challenge ourselves and where we grow. So I think that's, that's really the, the essence of and when it comes to figuring out what you want to do and how you want to do it, really what you create. What my new book is actually about, your body of work. What, what's that body of work that you want to create in the world? And then what work mode do you want to use in order to do it? Sometimes it's great to be an employee. I learned so much about training and development and organization change and coaching and everything from being funded by a really wonderful organization that I work for. And then when I was ready to go on my own, I, I learned other things that way. Absolutely. And I think that is a, a real fundamental value for those of us here at Creative Live is the, the art of creation and the process of creation is really the, the mode by which we improve not only the world but also ourselves. And we're really focused on this, this trend of creative entrepreneurialism. Um, and I think you, you're an um, entrepreneurial uh, in, in, enthusiast or positive entrepreneurialism, or what's your, what's your um, you have a phrase. I have it in my notes here that you are. I forget what I said. Uh, I entrepreneurial optimist. Yeah. Entrepreneurial yeah. optimist. Yeah. And, and this idea that uh, you know, the things that we create can improve the world is, hmm. I think it's just, it's a great, outlook and a great uh, like mindset to approach every day with. Yeah, well, you know, I think this is probably, you know, some of it my like hippie Northern Californian growing up in Marin County roots, you know, mm -hmm. but also having a background in, in community development. You know, we, we have a beautiful planet. We're kind of messed things up a lot. There are a lot of people that have huge needs. We have some really significant social issues, economic pe you know, issues. There are a lot of people um, that have a really rough life. And one of the things that I think entrepreneurship can do, first of all, is to really forge connections with people, you know, who, um, who have ideas, who need help to get access to resources. Everything about the move to online education makes me so happy because it really, really removes the barrier a lot for people to just get access to information. It's not that they don't have the same intelligence and creativity and enthusiasm, they just lack access to mentors and into education. And so where we're able to use our superpowers for good, as my friend Marilyn Scott Water says, right? Where we're able to do things that actually help contribute 
to making the earth a happier, healthier place to be. To me, that's, that's the place that I like to play. Again, not everybody is that way. Some people are totally excited by business, you know, making money, that's, that's their thing, and that's okay. But to me, it's really like, what are we doing this in service of? And I think that when we get away from some of the root of understanding, like what actually are things that can bring us closer together and help us solve real problems, you know, that's where I start to get excited. We're using technology, insight, disruption, innovation to be solving some things that actually can be solved if we just put a priority on them. So to me, there's tremendous opportunity to do that. And, and I think that's exactly the type of opportunity that we're trying to go after here at Creative Live. We are about connecting people from all over the world for free with the best experts in a particular field yeah. and providing access to skills that can help individuals change their own lives. And, and that's you know, my, my personal motto is that, you know, or personal model for Creative Live is that we're changing the world one life at a time. Yeah. And it, that's really inspiring for, for me to get up in the morning and come to work and stay late because I know that some kid in Nicaragua yeah. is going to see a photography expert that is going to inspire him to create his own photography. Exactly. Or is going to, you know, watch yourself and get... Uh, tips and advice on how to cross the value of that, how to take that first step toward an entrepreneurial journey. Um, we had a, a woman on the couch just before you, Alana Rivera from uh, Ed and Billy Soaps, who is her main passion is soap making. I think I, I have it. I have it right here. She, she gave me this gift, and this is her side hustle. She still has a full time day job. Huh. She is making soaps that appear in um, boutiques all over San Francisco and are starting to get a little bit of national attention. Mm -hmm. And she's at that point of fear where when does she take it the full leap and, and how does she go uh, you know, full time? So I just sort of babbled on for a little while. I get, I get passionate and just kind of go off. But I love it, right? That's what it's about. That's what it's about. Maybe yeah. you can talk a little bit about, about overcoming the, the two things. Um, so t maybe a little bit about fear mm -hmm. and overcoming fear. I know you did a lot of that on the main stage. Um, and number two, how do you... What's the worst? My, my, my philosophy on entrepreneurship, if you can handle the worst day yeah. and you're prepared for the worst day, you're going to have a lot more opportunities to experience your best days. What's the worst day you've had as an entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. And then how do you personally, uh, or what do you, you know, maybe some examples of other people overcoming fear? Yeah. Sort of the worst phrase question. I totally blew my John Stewart moment. But <laughs> We babble at you for a while, and then you babble back, and we'll keep going. I totally got it. See, yeah. I'm a coach, so I, I totally got right. it. But Afterwards, and, you can coach me on how to do a better and, and And Stewart is my maiden name, actually, so mm. I've got the John Stewart. But fear, so fear is actually it's so, so fascinating. In the work that I do, I didn't know that this was going to be the case when I started out, but fear is actually a huge element of, of the work that I do. And being a martial artist... Now I do mixed martial arts, which is you know, different than, than capoeira. But being a martial artist, that's one of the things you get very familiar with, is personal fear yes. and actual fear of a fist in your face, you know, which I've had <laughs> many times, you know, being taken down by big people. Or the last belt test that I did in MMA, you have to close your eyes. And I have these you know, huge guys that, that um, I'm training with and my teacher that would just attack me randomly from different sides, right? Choke me from the side, and I have to get out of those um, those situations in order to prove myself. So it's very scary and fear is really, you know, always coursing through my body. What I've really learned is, is it is part of the creative process. And one of the things that you need to learn about it is it's actually there as a protective force. So that we have a, oh, we all have a lizard brain or lizard brain kind of the, you know, early stage of our brain development that we have right at the course of our brain is constantly flashing hundreds if not thousands of times a day signals that there's not enough and somebody's going to get you. Not enough, right. somebody's going to get Danger. you. Danger. Right. And the reason why it's there is so that we don't die off. That's why we're still around, right? It's a protective force to make sure that we don't do anything really foolish. Right. So when you know that, what I like to do is like having a little imaginary dialogue with my fear. You can animate it. You can give it a name, right? Whatever you want. But does, you can does say- Does your fear have a name? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a name for my fear. Um, My fear's but, name is Charlotte. <laughs> but, you know, it's helpful to, to give it that. And you can really say, okay, like, what are you afraid of? I'm afraid if I quit my job, in the case of our wonderful soap-making uh, entrepreneur, if I'm afraid if I quit my full-time job, I'm going to live in a van down by the river. Right. 
right? That's mostly what we're afraid of. I'll be 35 divorced and be in a van down by yeah. the river, as Chris Farley said in Saturday Night Live. So um, then you ask yourself, well, why? Why do you think that's going to happen? Well, because I'm not making enough sales. Okay, well, you've made some. So what are you concerned about? Oh, well, you know, I don't have time to do it, or I don't really know how to sell into this market, even though it's really big. As you start to go in and diagnose the fear, all of a sudden it becomes a practical, tactical question that you can ask somebody with more experience and it becomes a problem that can be solved, right? right? And if it can't, like some people should not quit their job at all right now, right? Mm -hmm. If they haven't proven their concept, if they don't have a profitable idea, if they need to have a regular paycheck, it may not right. be the time to do it. But I know personally, you know, it really gives me strength actually having worked with so many people in my own journey, you know, my husband's an entrepreneur as well. He has a construction business um, in Phoenix, and he does, you know, he, he's really hardworking, an amazing, amazing person. Has the talk about a positive attitude. I've nobody like never met anybody like him. And um, he, we had just expanded our business, his business. He had bought brand new equipment, um, huge heavy equipment. He was doing all kinds of projects throughout the valley in Phoenix. I had a brand new baby. Our baby was was had just been born. Um, Angela, and um, I got a book deal. So I was running my business, had a book to write. Congratulations, first book. congratulations, congratulations. And then 2007, 2008, the entire economy collapsed. Yep. And we went from like being totally comfortable and safe to being in a complete and total financial disaster. It was the scariest thing I have ever experienced in my life. And the, the interesting thing, my dad actually told me, you know, during that time, I, I really, it pr produced so much anxiety because I, here I was writing a book about why you should quit your stable corporate job to start a business. And in the meantime, my own financial reality at that moment, not from my business, but from our family's situation, was really, really tough. Yeah. And I, I just, at times I was like, I can't write this book. Like, I just can't do it. And my dad said, you know what? You're going to write a better book because of this experience. And what I, the way I took that situation is to say, this is serious. Like, if I tell somebody, in, you know, if I help them to evaluate whether or not they want to leave to leave their job to start a business, I want to be giving them very good advice. I'm not going to sugarcoat things. We were saying before the interview, it's not all unicorns and no. rainbows. It's tough. It's hard. It can be very financially devastating at times. But you know, if it's important to you, if you really want to stick with it, then it's going to be worth it to do it. And you know? failure is a possibility. This isn't a joke here. A lot of, like, most businesses fail within the first three years. Yeah. And it's eyes wide open. But if you are passionate about something yeah. and you've done it as a side hustle for a while, you can remove some of that risk. If you have a validated concept, then you can get a little closer. And then when it comes, you know, you'll, you'll find yourself at this edge of, wow, this is really viable, and then making that leap isn't such a big leap as it was from the very beginning. You don't yeah. have to just cut the cord and, and, and go from the start. Exactly. And, you know, and it's not just in the beginning. It's as you get going because, you know, my husband's yeah. case, he already had a really successful business. It was growing, you know, and everything seemed to be good. But the economy shifts or, mm -hmm. you know, your biggest client goes away or you get sick or, you know, a spouse gets sick. There's so many things that can happen. So... Yeah, I think the biggest lesson that, that I have and what I always teach um, my clients and those I work with is, you know, fear is not something to pound through, to avoid. If you are scared, that's okay. It's protecting you. But you know, what we learn in martial arts is you, you lean into it. Not that kind of Sheryl Sandberg right. lean in. Right. <laughs> but like if somebody you, you is You lean big, in in martial arts, you get punched right. in the face. Yeah. But, you know, but actually you want to lean in and avoid the punch. Right. But you're going to be more safe if you're in close yeah. rather than if you have the whole reach of somebody's fist that's in your yeah. face. Right? You, you, you want to be close to the person in order to see what's going on is the way that you're really going to stay protected. So it's... We're, I'm sort of, as we're going through and having these conversations, I'm kind of bullet pointing the, the lessons, these secrets from Silicon Valley, if you will. And earlier this morning, one of the secrets was um, ask for help. This is a, uh, a real community where people share information, and if they don't know something, they, they go to their network and they, they find help. Um, you know, test and be willing to fail. And this third one about fear as a signal, I like to think of fear, fear as um, uh, so like you, I want to steer into fear. Um, if 
if fear is signaling to you that there is danger ahead, mm -hmm. it's like like ice. You know, on a, on a, you're driving on ice on a, on a uh, winter road, mm -hmm. and you start to you, tar, you start to skid. You, you steer into yeah. the, the the direction of the skid. And so I find in my own life that if I direct my energy toward my fear, toward overcoming things, my mic's having problems. Yeah. I was on a roll there too, <laughs> getting real emotional. Um, that if I steer into the the course of my fear, that that's a good signal that okay, I'm going to put my you know here at Creative Live, I'm going to put my attention towards the things that I worry about, the things that keep me up at night. Like, are we going to be able to you know do this thing, that thing? And and by steering towards the things that scare me the most, it uh, you can make progress against them, and and you can you know as as you check check off the boxes toward that fear, you. You, you take them away, you build success, you move forward. Yeah. I don't know. So I think maybe that's that's the third thing is lean into it or steer into the fear and like and, and work towards, acknowledge it and work towards overcoming it. Exactly. And diagnose it. It's like really separating out what is just, you know, a kind of irrational fear. And, right. and I, it's interesting working with people. There's I've talked to folks who have no debt. Their house is fully paid for. They have three years worth of savings in just a separate savings account in addition to retirement income and all of that, right? And they can be petrified to leave their job to start a business. Even yeah. though, then I know people who have like one week savings, if that, you know, lots and lots of debt, but they're like, they're ready to go. They're ready to take the risk. So a lot of it is just, you know, understanding your risk tolerance and separating out what is a fear that is, you know, really realistic that you should be afraid of. Like we're often trained to avoid the fear and don't listen and crush it. I, that's a, Terrible advice. No. Like you said, understand it. Figure out what actually is the real danger. Protect yourself against the dangers that you need to. But then when you begin to under, you know, answer the questions that are related to irrational fears, that's where you keep moving forward. Right. Uh, I'd love to go to the audience. Uh, I kind of prepped you guys earlier that if you had any tactical questions, Pamela would be a great resource to ask those. Um, any, any questions from the studio audience right now? Yeah. Just uh, tell us uh, just your name, a little bit about you know where you're from, what you're doing, and then then fire away. Okay, great. My name is Roland from Sacramento, Hi, Roland. and I'm in fin financial services and trying to figure out how to uh, take financial services an, an old school business model and kind of transform it with this new technology today. And so my question um, is not so much about what I'm doing, but more uh, of a uh, you know how would you balance uh, Pamela, you know your passion, you know and your purpose. And paying the bills, yeah. and and especially if you, you were fortunate enough to have a spouse who is also entrepreneurial minded, mm -hmm. which which in most cases is that's not the case. Yeah. So how do you balance that? I, I love that question. My dad grew up in Yuba City, which is right up there by the Sacramento area. So, you know the um, the the balances. I, I think in, in many times when you have, it's really important. I think to have a driving purpose and a, and a passion for what you're doing. It also needs to meet very specific market need and you know people that you want to serve. Sometimes a lot of it can come down to how it is that you actually break down your plan and how it is that you choose to fund it. And I was giving that example before sometimes of being your own venture capitalist. There can be times where it is so prudent to be staying in your full-time job, right? Get very specific about what you need to learn in order to execute your business idea and then slowly develop it on the side, you know, to the point where you really think that you can grow. Often if you have, you know, just massive passion for something, and you can't find the business model in it, and you're not making any money, um, that's where I try to like, move you as quickly as possible into what is one way that you can monetize what you're doing, right? Maybe it's not exactly the way, maybe it's not gonna be you know, an app or a whole different way you're using technology yet, but as you think about who it is that you wanna serve you know, with an idea of a different model for financial services, is there one way that you can start to kind of have a test where you can be providing a service that people will pay for? And over time, you know, some kinds of businesses do take a whole bunch of time to develop conceptually before the money comes. But other businesses, especially something that can have a service component to it, you can actually have the money that's coming in a lot easier. You know, On the side, that has to do with family relationships. I did a whole chapter in my book about that because it's massively significant, right? When you go into business, your whole family goes into business, right? So you need to have really open, clear communication figure out exactly what are everybody's concerns, right? What are the numbers that make sense to you? If, for example, you decide to go full time, you can say, all right, either six months goes by or we get to this level of our savings account, and then here's plan B, right? 
I'll go to, you know, I'll go back to work, no problem, to build up a little bit more cash. Or maybe if your spouse isn't working, your spouse goes back to work. The key is that you really talk through what are the concerns. And I remember once I had a client who was kind of upset at, at his spouse. Like, you know, she doesn't support me. She doesn't support my creative dreams. And I said, well, tell me specifically why. And he said, well, every time I, you know, I want to run a business, like, she's just really negative about it. And I said, well, talk to her about it. He went and he talked to her, came back. It turns out her dad had had this whole series of failed entrepreneurial ventures when she was a child that caused tremendous stress and anxiety for her as a child. And they had a family. They had small children at home. So it wasn't that she wasn't supportive of his creative dreams. She was terrified of giving her kids the same kind of uncertainty and insecurity as she had had growing up. That's a totally different situation. When he knew that, he could be much more compassionate, and then they could build a plan together. So I think a lot of times through communication, um, and if your spouse you know, is a woman, a lot of communication, <laughs> many conversations right, can, um, can happen. But you really want to get to a place where you have some agreements. And you know, occasionally there are times where, I know not in your case, but occasionally there are times where when people really start to pursue what they're interested in, some of their relationships change, right? Sometimes marriages end or friendships end. And, and sometimes it's actually because in the long term they're not really you know, aligned for the new direction. I don't want that ever, but you, know, it's, you, you have to make sure that both of you are really aware of the risks and that you make mutual decisions around it. And that you have a, a plan. Yeah. Next question. Hi, um, you just um, led right into my question, which is moving from Barclays Global Investors to entrepreneurship, you not only had to change your job and what you were doing, but your social circles. Um, I'm in the process of making a similar transition. My name's Maggie. And um, what advice would you give yourself um, if you think back to the, making those transitions of your social circles and your network? especially being a pioneering woman in entrepreneurship. Yes. That's a yes. very well-phrased question. Maybe you no. should come up and, and interview <laughs> later. Next time she'll great lead job. the interview. No, yeah. you're doing a great job. Right? But um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, it's a huge, very surprising thing sometimes. I think we don't really realize it. And it can actually be upsetting both when you're the entrepreneur and it also can be for your friends around you. So I think a couple things around it. One of them is um, you can absolutely maintain great friendships and connections with people that have always been, you know, your friends. I have friends I've known since preschool, you know, still. Not everybody, but a few of those kind of folks. So some people, you maintain the, the relationship with them. Um, d you don't want to become that boring person who's constantly talking about their business ideas with a bunch of folks who are entrepreneurs and you end up annoying all of them, right? Because you're constantly talking about your ideas. They may not be interested. They might not have the experience. Some people get threatened. It, it, it's never usually our intention, but they might say, well, wait a minute. If you're really going out there and you're following your dreams, then what you're saying is, I'm a loser for not following mine. And they get very defensive, sometimes very negative about your ideas. So there are always going to be people I've found personally that help kind of follow you through that transition. But what you want to do quickly is to establish a new peer network to really be working your business ideas. And the, I mentioned earlier in my presentation this morning, you think about three different circles. You have your peer mentors, people who are doing similar things. I, like, I identified a woman when I was first starting my blog. I didn't even know what a blog was. And we met in a marketing class. She's, uh, her site is Entrepreneurial MD. And she's a, a former medical doctor who wa is, works with doctors to help them start businesses. So it's kind of a similar type of thing, but different markets. So she and I talked once every two weeks for a year as we were getting our blogs and our businesses off the ground. We shared resources. You know, we had similar kinds of situations going on. And that really, really helped. So you want your peer mentors. You want new technical mentors doing things like attending creative live events, go to interesting conferences. You know, um, And then, then you have your High Council of Jedi Knight members, people who you really, really admire. You know, For me, it's Guy Kawasaki and Dan Pink. And, Nancy Duarte and people who you can really admire for the, the level to which they've you know they've grown and developed and that way you just start to get connected with a whole new ecosystem mm -hmm. but don't forget folks you know some people won't cross that bridge with you so you can really honor you know honor them but also realize that all relationships are not meant to necessarily follow you through your entire life and that's okay I would just be as gracious as possible about it which I'm sure I'm sure that you are but it's it, it's okay some friendships will end and Unfortunately, that's part of it. I think we are about out of time. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us on the couch. Yeah. Um, maybe just before you go, how are you enjoying your time at Creative Life so far? 
I am having a totally fantastic time because remember, this is my hometown. So first of all, coming into San Francisco is wonderful. But um, also, because I'm so excited by creative ideas and creative people, it's kind of the like mecca of, <laughs> of all of that, where we're creating things and having great conversations. So I'm excited, and I get to come back in you July. Have a little promo for your course. I'm doing three full days on Escape from Cubicle Nation for July 10th, 11th, and 12th, as a matter of fact. How's that for a promo? That is an awesome <laughs> promo. Uh, people can connect with you directly at Pam Slim, at on, Pam Twitter Slim on Twitter. And uh, PamSlim.com. It's actually Escape from Cubicle Escape Nation. Escape from Cubicle Nation. Nation. Mm -hmm. uh, Big hand for Pamela Slim, everybody. Thank you.